While traveling through this world of sorrow, I'm on my way to glory land. I'll not turn back for some tomorrow. My trials here I'll understand. I want to know more about my Jesus. I want to know more about my Lord. I want to know more about that mansion i'm gonna receive as my reward i want to know more about that homeland i mean to go there someday somehow and after i reach that heavenly city i mean to know more than i know now I'm glad I know the blessed Savior, for through his blood he set me free. Though rough the road, I shall not waver, for some glad day his face I'll see. I want to know more about my Jesus. I want to know more about my Lord. I want to know more about that mansion I'm going to receive as my reward. I want to know more about that homeland. I mean to go there someday somehow. And after I reach that heavenly city, I mean to know more than I know now. He promised when his soul ascended, I'm coming back, the Lord did say. If on his promise you've depended, on wings of love you'll soar away. I want to know more about my Jesus. I want to know more about my Lord. I want to know more about that mansion I'm going to receive as my reward. I want to know more about that homeland. I mean to go there someday somehow. And after I reach that heavenly city, I mean to know more than I know now. Shackled by a heavy burden Neath a load of guilt and shame Then the hand of Jesus 
Jesus touched me and now I am no longer the same he touched me oh he touched me and all the joy that flood my soul something and now I know he touched me and made me whole since I met this blessed Savior since he cleansed and made me I will never cease to praise Him. I'll shout it while eternity rolls. He touched me. Oh, He touched me. And oh, Floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know He touched me and made me whole. He touched me, oh, He touched me. my soul something happened and now I know he touched me and made me
remove anything that stands in the way. Whatever the price to have you in my life, dear Lord, I pray. Is there a mountain that I need to climb? Is there a valley you want to make mine? Is there a river I need to cross through? Whatever it takes, I'm willing to face to be close to you. Whatever it takes, I'm willing to face to be close to you. Let me give you a couple needed prayer requests tonight before I preach. I want to mention this so I don't overlook it in a little bit. Remember Karen Dudley, she really needs our prayers. I talked with her just a little while ago, and she really, really needs our prayers uh, with what she's going through and what she's having to uh, deal with with her infection battle and all that. Just remember her, lift her up to the Lord in prayer. And then Miss Angie that just lost her son Jude had an aunt to pass away, so... She really needs our prayers. That's a lot of losses in a short time. The aunt was just over to the house uh, visiting with her and all, and then she just passed away. So uh, please, please pray much for Angie. God would help her and the family as they go through these terrible days that they're having to deal with. And uh, life is real, and it has a lot of heartaches that goes with it. And uh, we just pray in God's grace to be with them and help them in these these hours as they go through that. Uh, remember me, I've got to visit with the family this week, and, and I have a funeral to perform uh, Friday. So pray much that the Lord would help me as I attend to this family. They live up in Taylorsville. Uh, they've reached out to me to help. I buried the son just uh, a couple of years ago, and now the mother has passed away. And... Uh, just pray the Lord help us to be a good witness, a good testimony to them there. Um, so lift them up. You're losing me. You're moving me. Uh, my sound's coming and going. <clears throat> so anyway, remember that family. Lift them up. Pray God would touch and help and, and uh, give them comfort and grace as they go through these hours. Uh, they really do need our prayer. So lift them up. Yes, ma'am. Remember those two. Remember those two. And then remember uh, the one that Corey mentioned this morning. Uh, his friend's dad has uh, got a very dim outlook with his battle. Uh, so lift them up. Pray much for that situation. The Lord would touch and help them. All right. Let's go to the Lord. We're going to pray about this. Then we'll get into our scripture text this evening. Father, as we come before you tonight, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. Lord, as we talked about in Sunday school this morning, the privilege that we have for intercessory prayer. And we come to you tonight in uh, behalf of these. Uh, Miss Angie, Lord, she's really going through a lot of hard times here. And I just pray that the grace of God would be evident in her life. And, Lord, you would wrap your loving arms around her. Let her realize that there's a God in heaven that's all about her and love on her and help her and uh, put in our hearts what we can and need to do. Give us wisdom there. Then, Lord, we pray for this, and Miss Sue's just mentioned two requests, uh, two different ones there that's got some uh, cancers to deal with. I pray that you'd uh, work in that, God, that you'd give grace and mercy in your healing hand. We pray that, God, you would give that help in healing. We do ask again tonight for Miss Gail, for Brother Jack, uh, for Miss Karen. God, she really needs your touch. Help her, Lord, as she deals with great pain in her situation now. 
uh, give her relief of that pain. Lord, help the doctors to do what needs to be done to get her fixed up and get her past this this very painful stage. Uh, so please help Karen tonight, Lord. Give her a good night of rest and pray the antibodies would, would do their work quickly and uh, help her to get um, able to get around and do things that she desires to do once again. And uh, we'll thank you for that. Again, be with Miss Judy. Help her tonight, Lord. Um, as she heals up, as the um, spasms will see, since she'll do better with that, and uh, the pain will be minimal, Lord. We know she's going to have some pain there, but Lord, we pray for the uh, least amount there, that you'd help her with that, and then help her to heal up quickly, help her to be mindful of what she's going through and needs to do, and uh, to take good care of herself. Uh, and uh, Lord, we just pray your protection there. Thank you, Lord, for the staff that we've dealt with, from the doctor all the way down to the to the nurses, God, and all that they did. We pray your blessings on them. Thank you, Lord, for how good they took care of her. And I ask you, Lord, to bless them greatly. And, uh, Lord, uh, help us as we go back to be a blessing to them, God, that uh, we can do that and make a difference in their life and encourage them. Father, we thank you for loving us. Thank you for the place you've given us to come together and worship. And uh, we pray that you'll meet the needs of each and every one that's here tonight. Help us as we try to preach the message you uh, directed our hearts to and use it to encourage us and strengthen us and stir us. And, uh, Lord, I pray, should there be one here lost or one that's tuned in with us that's lost, I ask you, God, to please deal with their heart in a great and a harsh way. Lord, let them realize, Lord, there's a hail out there that awaits them, but there's a heaven, and the Lord Jesus Christ is loved if they'll just come to him. And I pray you'll help them to, to realize that, that, Lord, time's running out in their uh, ability to call on you, and I pray they'll do that uh, swiftly. Help those that's cold and indifferent to, Lord, get right with you, deal with their hearts. There's many on our hearts tonight going through our minds as we even pray now that, Lord, needs you, and I pray that you'll help them to see their uh, what they're missing in serving you and the blessings and the, the, the wonderful times that we have together. And I just pray that you'd have your will in that and uh, meet those needs, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Luke chapter number 16 this evening, I want to share a thought with you, and uh, we'll not be too long on you tonight, but I want to share a thought with you that the uh, uh, Lord gave me this thought many years ago, and I did a similar thought one time, and uh, I think we preached it here. Uh, we took a visit to Miss Martha's house one time in Mark chapter 10, but tonight we're going to visit the rich man's house in Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. The Bible says in verse number 19, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, and a rich man died also and was buried. And in hell lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth, afar off, uh, seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, Son, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went, from, uh, went to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither Will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead? May the Lord add his blessings to the reading. I want to look at this a little bit tonight as we visit the rich man's house. We're not going to look a whole lot at Lazarus. We're not going to deal with the beggar a whole lot tonight. 
Uh, but it is amazing how that the story flips. Looks like the rich man has it made easy living, takes it uh, easy in this life. Old Lazarus, obviously a saved man, had it rough. Notice he didn't even he didn't even ask for a loaf of light bread or a, or a ham sandwich. He just wanted the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. But the rich man would not even go out there and give him his crumbs. Wouldn't help him in any way, shape, or form. Now he is wanting Lazarus to come and just to touch his finger in water and touch his parched tongue. Uh, Moses or Aram says, nah, remember in your lifetime you had the good things. And I want to look at this, think about this rich man just a little bit tonight. I, I've been listening to the news and this NFL draft and some of the mess they got going on and the monies that they're paying out. I got thinking about rich folk a little bit tonight. And they got that quarterback, the, the quarterback Lamar Jackson playing for Baltimore, and he they talked about his salary, what he's going to get. $260 million over a five-year contract with a guarantee of him getting $185 million. I looked at that $260 million. Man, what a deal that is. How would you like to make $142,465.75 a day? Put me in there. I'd play a little football for that. Hey Amen. I'd take a lick for that. That's, that's good money. Good night. The doctors put me back together after one game. I'd be good to go. Hey Amen. <laughs> Are you kidding me? $142,465.75 a day? There ain't none of them guys worth that kind of money. Hey Amen. The only one worth that kind of money is my grandson. Baby Clay's worth it. Amen. I got, to, I got to looking and thinking about it. Well, there's another guy uh, that was getting a contract with Philadelphia for $255 million, old Jalen Hurts. I thought to myself, first off, where do they get that kind of money to be able to pay them boys that? Of course, I've never been to a live NFL football game. Never have been there. I honestly, most, I just soon, unless I'm on the 50-yard line down there where I can see the real deal, I just soon watch it from the house. I get replays, and, and my popcorn's cheap. I got the best-looking waitress. I can flirt with her and not get in trouble. Y'all with me? If one of them cheerleaders walk by, I won't be able to see for a month. Because Judy going to knock my eyeballs out. Say amen right there. But I can flirt with my waitress at the house, and, it, and it's legal. Amen. So, you know, you think about these rich folks and all the money they got. I, I looked up Garth Brooks. Y'all know he was one of the, the wealthiest, in a hurry, country music singers. Well, he's got a nice little pad to live in. It's only 14,000 square foot. That's his house. 14,000 square foot. Uh, most of our houses in our group is less than 3,000 square foot. That, that nice pad I had over yonder was 2658 or 20, 2856, one to the other. Pretty good size. That's a lot of house. 14,000 square feet. And it's worth $3.5 million. Well, we looked at one that was $4 million down here in Lake Norman. $4 million. Looked like it's on about a half an acre. <laughs> but it's waterfront. And those folks, it looks like, man, they've got anything and everything that you could ask for. And let's say for a little bit tonight that you get to enjoy the finer things of life. Hear, hear this guy, when you look at this rich man, what he had, he had the finest of clothes. When you read verse 19, he had uh, purple and fine linen. That's the best top quality that there is. Purple, by the way, is a color of royalty. Had that, had that purple on and, and all that fine linen. Man, he's got the best of the best of the best. So here's a guy, here's a guy that's got to find clothes. If you look, he's got a fortress there that he's living in, his nice big pad. 
you've got Lazarus that's laying outside the gate to his house. Now, y'all seen the gates. Y'all know what them thing is. Uh, very, very elegant made, usually got some fancy designs made to it. And uh, when you get to getting that kind of welding done or that kind of fabricating done, you get into the big dollars. You know how them folks that can weld made big money. Like Ricky D, he's a big welder, you know. But they did that. I mean, you got all these finer things. Nice gate. The only gate I had at my house was to keep the young going down the stairs. Y'all with me? Jacob had a couple doggy gates. This guy got one of them gates out there, and he's a beggar lays at his door. I'm surprised he let him lay there. I really am. I'm, I'm surprised that he didn't tell one of his servants to go out there and get that beggar out of here. Take him, carry him down the street somewhere. Get him away from here. He don't, he don't like that kind of So you got a nice fortress here. Well, he's got a furnished house. He talks about his house there and the food that he's got. Man, he's got good food. Beggars wanting just the crumbs from his table, so he's got good food. He's got the finer things of life. He's got a father. Uh, verse 27 talks about his father. Uh, we know that he's got a father because verse 28 talks about his brothers. Can't have brothers without a father. Hello? That's just a little something for some of them folks out there to think about. You don't have brothers and sisters without fathers and mothers. Amen. If you stopped at verse number 19, it sounds like this rich guy has got it. I don't know what his age was. It didn't say that he was an old rich man. So I don't know whether he's a young rich man or an old rich man. I don't know. I know he died. So it didn't matter how old he was. He died. Well, in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torment. So when you see what this rich man had, if you stopped at what he had, it seems like this guy's got it. And young folks these days, they look at these richer, finer things. Somebody was showing off some fancy cars earlier today, and uh, everything I got and what you got too wouldn't buy one of them. Say amen right there. They got some fancy stuff, you know. And Maserati starts at $125,000 and go up from there. By the way, I hope your insurance, Angela, I'm throwing in a plug for the insurance folks. Uh, I hope your insurance is up there where it'll cover one of those because if one of them pulls out in front of you or you pull out in front of them and hit them, tear it up, you better have some money on your insurance plan. You know, we used to get by with what was the easiest, the cheapest, uh, but you better be able to cover it. Johnny's car, if you hit it, $250,000 riding around in Statesville. Y'all seen them Lamborghinis and Ferraris and all that other stuff running around in Statesville? They got them. Y'all need to get out once in a while. Amen. They got all kinds of fancy cars around here. You see a Porsche everywhere you turn. Look like, look like them rich folks has got it. And sometimes, if you ain't careful, you'll get like I do sometimes. And I do that because that's the way David did sometimes. Sometimes God's folks will get to looking at the rich man's world and think, man. But now if you'll study a little bit on what the rich man didn't have. Now you're getting into, now you're getting into telling, do you want to be the rich man or you want to be saved? <laughs> now I ain't saying you can't be rich and be saved too. Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man. He provided the tomb for Jesus. He loved Jesus. He was a saved man, no doubt there. And, and he and Nicodemus took care of Jesus' body after the crucifixion. So you can, be a, you can be a highfalutin person and still love Jesus. Amen. So I'm not saying just because they got money, they don't know God. But if you had to pick between knowing God and having money, I'm picking God. Amen. Amen. That money, that money don't warm you up in the middle of the night. That money don't bring comfort in a time of troubles. That money don't help you when you've got great sorrows upon you. What he didn't have, I'll show you one thing he didn't have. One thing he didn't have that I like a whole bunch is a family in church. You know why I'm in church today? Because mom and dad took me to church when I was little. My mom and daddy carried me to church as a young man. I got saved young because mom and daddy had me in church. I haven't been around a lot of famous, but we, we eat lunch with a famous person today. I'll not call his name, but we eat lunch with a famous person today. And uh, he sat right there beside us. 
And I, I know some famous folks. And uh, we got one with us tonight, famous, been on the front page of the newspaper a lot. And uh, I showed him how to do that. But anyway, uh, famous don't mean a whole lot if you don't know God. See, I, I'd rather have family in church because when you got family in church, uh, this guy here didn't have a praying mom and daddy. I don't know about you tonight, but you think about that just a little bit. That's, that's worth more than any money in the bank is a praying mama and a praying daddy. Somebody that in your behalf is going to God. Because when, when they're going to God for you, that intercessory prayer that they're making for you, that, that's, that's one of the most valuable things you can have. You know, I told you the story here a while back about the, uh, the soldier that was on the battlefield and they needed to recover something that was out in the middle of the field and uh, the, 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 the young soldier told his sergeant, said he'd go get it, but, but tell him when it was such and such a time back home. The sergeant didn't understand that. That boy took off out there when it was that time, got it, retrieved it, and come back. And uh, the sergeant said, son, I've got to know, why in the world did you wait? I believe it was 4 o'clock in the evening. Or so. He said, why in the world did you say wait till 4 o'clock to go get that? He said, because I know every day at 4 o'clock, my mommy's on her knees praying for me. And if my mama's praying for me, I'm all right. Now, we talk about real life stuff where folks is throwing bullets at you. And he had enough confidence in his mama's prayer to know that during that four, during that four o'clock praying time, he was under the shelter. He was under that brooding hen protection. Amen? You know, it's good to have a praying father and a praying mother. Hallelujah it is. Uh, why does why does he he need somebody sent to his house if his mom and daddy's praying? If they're going to tell the five brothers about the Lord, uh, why do you need to send somebody else to the house? Amen. Do we need to send somebody to your house? Are you a praying mom and a praying daddy over your youngins? I mean, listen, if you're going to pray for anybody, y'all be praying for your youngins. Amen. You know, a lot of times folk ask me to pray for their family, and I don't, don't think harsh on me of this, but I've thought sometimes, are you praying for them? I'm honored that somebody would ask me to pray for them, but you ought to be able to pray too. You know, you got just as much right to the throne of God as I do if you're saved. Amen. That never hit a little stump, didn't it? You got a family in church. I'm telling you, you need to understand how valuable it is to have a family in church. There's nothing godly around this house. They don't know God. There's nothing godly going on around there. They don't listen to godly music. They listen to that head-banging mess. Hey, man, they used to call that devil music. Did y'all know that? I need to reiterate some of the old-timers saying so that this young crowd realize what they're messing with. That's devil music. You gotta be careful. You gotta be careful what music you listen to, cause music sets attitudes. I could crank up some stuff right now, and you'd be mad before you got out of this building. It'll just do that to you. You don't believe me? Ride with me sometime. Let one of them ride up behind me and see what my attitude change. I'm not a mean fella, but there's been a time or two I'd like to get out of the car and put that dude's speaker out. I'm just saying, I can't stand some of that. It just, mm. well, you know what? That's what that music's designed for. Did y'all ever, did y'all ever hear the Indians play in Beth, Beth Haven before they went to fight? Beethoven. Didn't you not hear me? Beethoven. Uh, would you, Ricky, would you let him borrow ear, ear, hearing aid or something or another over here so he can hear? You know, have you ever heard the Indians get all excited listening to Beethoven? <laughs> Ain't that something? That, no, they don't listen to no Beethoven or classical stuff or a nice easy saxophone playing. No, they don't listen to that. They got that drum stuff going. Trying to get you all excited and stirred up the flesh. That's what that music does. You don't need all that. You need something that will speak to the heart. Now, I told you I was listening to some of that newer music at a funeral one time. 
and and people over there patting their foots and getting they didn't do not, didn't do nothing to help the family with their hurting hearts. But after they got the junk out of the way, there was a couple got over there in Acapulco. How, how did he Acapulco? Ain't that the way Barney said it? They sung Acapulco. I know it's acapella. I understand. I'm just doing Barney on you. Uh, they sung some old hymns and it ministered to the hearts of those that were broken. See, you got the, you got you, that godly music around the house. It'll help you some, amen. It'll now listen. I don't listen. I don't listen to Amazing Grace and hold hands with Judy. If I'm wanting to, if I'm wanting to uh, be romantic, I, I I'll put on something easy to help us with romantics, amen. I know what I'm doing. I've been married 36 happy years. Don't you tell her I said that. Good music, something around the house, godly things going on, godly stories. You know, my grandma used to sit down and read God's stories to us. Y'all awful quiet tonight. You grandmas ain't reading no Bible stories to your youngins. Y'all just sit around with them a little bit and tell them a little bit about Jesus. They need to know that it wasn't Jonah that built the ark. Hello, yeah, he rode in the boat, but it wasn't an ark. They need to know these things. We want, them to, we want them to have good degrees, and I think it's good to have education. Amen. I need some, but that's okay. It's good to have some, it's good to have some education, but I'd much rather them know Jesus than all the education in the world. Know God and have some godly examples about them. Amen. Them old farmers kept their... Crops watered because they knowed God. Their crops would grow because they knowed God. I'm sorry, knew God. Y'all need new English, don't you? Amen. I can talk right if I need to. You wouldn't listen if I did, though, so. <clears throat> that monotone stuff don't keep good attention. If you don't believe me, go listen to Jacob teach class. You'll find out real quick. Amen. Turn to page number three. Everybody's. <laughs> Y'all know better than that. Y'all know better than that. He, he ain't never known monotone. He can't even spell it. <clears throat> you know, you know, <laughs> you know what this, you know what this rich man didn't have. He had all that money. Had had that fancy house. Had the fine clothes. Had plenty of food. He had all the finer things of life but he didn't have a family in church. You know what else he didn't have? This is real simple, y'all. You know what else he didn't have? Just turn around what I just said. He didn't have, it wasn't that he didn't just, he just didn't have a family in church. He didn't have a church family. Now that's something to think about. A church family. And when your heart's broke and you don't know if you're going to be able to put your foot in front of the other, you don't know what you're going to do, whether you're going to be able to get out of this hole, this valley, this troubles. Devils are fighting you and the family. You're going through it. You don't know whether you're going to make it. You know what? There's a church family. I'm going to tell you, one of the most valuable things you'll have beside Jesus himself in this life is a church family. Amen? That's what I like here. we got church family. Amen. Not, not, not that we nosy about everybody else's business, but if you need something, we can be there. Amen. Amen. We'll help you. We'll do, we'll do as a church family is supposed to do. I, I like church family. You know, I can go back in my life and I could stand here and go up 58 years of it and give you the crises out of my life. And out of every single crisis that we went through, we had church family. I had a preacher that beat you to the hospital. How in the world he done now, now listen, y'all, what y'all got to understand, this before this is for Snapchat, text messages, cell phones didn't even exist in those days. He beat you to the hospital. Amen. He didn't have to have a telephone. He'd just tell a woman. Amen. He got around. <laughs> and that's one of his, by the way. That's one of his. That's what he used to say a lot. How you get news around. You don't need a telegraph. You don't need a telephone. You don't need a television. You just tell a woman. Amen. That works. 
church family, folks that would pray for your family. Acts chapter 2, uh, two verse 42 says, And they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking bread and in prayers. See, them disciples went in that upper room and they all gathered together. There's 120 of them up there. And they was praying together. They was fellowshipping together. Why? Because their leader just died. What do you do when crisis comes? You get with your church family. See, if you got church, uh, family in a church, you ought to have a church family. Amen. Amen. Church family will be there to help you. Church family, hey, listen, church family don't operate on the 8 to 5. And if and if you and if you you got folks that's got a pastor that's an eight to fiver, you need to find a real pastor. Amen. You need to find somebody. Hey, listen, I know some of them that pull up in the parking lot of the hospital and send their wife in. They wouldn't even go in their cell. You know what they'll do? Revoke his pastor privileges. Amen. That's live and in color. And I'd say it again to them. If, if he don't go visit and, and see about his flock, there's something wrong. Amen. I, I'm called the pastor. That's a that's a under-shepherd for the Lord Jesus Christ over the flock. I'm glad I got a church family. I, I love it. I love my church family, folks that will pray for us. Hey, listen, uh, we was down there at the hospital. I know you folks was praying for Miss Judy. We got that. We got that call out thing we can do now. Somebody calls me and let me know there's a crisis. We can get folks to pray in like right now. Prayer works, doesn't it? Prayer helps. Amen. To know folks care enough to stop what they're doing and pray for you. That's love. Amen. And that's what a church family. This guy ain't got that. He's having to ask for a beggar out of heaven to be sent to his house because he's got five brothers that's going to hell. Problem with that guy is he waited too late to care about his brothers. You care about your folk? Do something now. You really love your family? They needing Jesus? Go to them now. Well, preacher, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to do that. You don't have to know how. Are you saved? Tell them how you got saved. Tell them what Jesus has done for you. Hey, listen. Tell them about your church family. A lot of folks don't know that we exist as a church family. They think we're just coming together for a social club. They think we just come together to have eatings. Amen? I know we give them a lot of evidence of that. <laughs> but that ain't the only reason we come together. We eat together because we like each other. Amen? Amen. That's what, that's what church family is all about. A church family that will prop you up when you need. See, Galatians 6.2 tells us to bear ye, no, bear ye one another's burden and so fulfill the law of Christ. Did y'all know it's a law for us to bear up one another's burdens? The law of Christ, Galatians 6.2. Y'all ain't lawbreakers, are you? You ever, you ever, you ever watch folk tighten up? I come, I come off a ramp today and he's hiding under the bridge over there, I got my seatbelt on. And I still looked at him and thought for a second, what's he going to do? I did. I did. I had to. somebody in front of me. But anyway, <laughs> see, that, that, that law stuff bothers folks. Well, Christ's law is more important than North Carolina law. I believe in abiding by the laws of North Carolina. I do believe in that. But Christ's law is more important than that. He said for us to bear, bear you up one another's burden. You know somebody's got a burden, y'all be praying for them. You know when they go to bed at night and they can't sleep, y'all to pray for them a little bit. If they can't sleep, you ought to be praying for them. A lot of folks have trouble with that. Everything in the world, you lay down and go to sleep, everything in the world race through your mind. And then here comes the devil. And he'll hover above a headboard there and talk crazy stuff to your mind. Nobody likes you. Nobody cares for you. Nobody loves you. Ain't nobody thinking about it. Yeah, you know, I had a guy one night, I was out walking the field. I, I, was, I was going through some stuff and making some decisions for Jesus. And I was out walking the backyard at 1130 at night. I know you folk go to bed early. I can tell you get plenty of beauty sleep. 
And uh, I was out walking. I was out walking around. God put it on His heart so strong. He called me at eleven thirty one night. While I'm out there walking around with a heavy burden driving me crazy, I don't know which way to go, what to do. It's just, it's heavy. And then we talked on the phone for a little while. You know, it's good. Enough. You know, Brother Lockard was famous for that. He'd called me a lot of times because he he knowed. He see he he told me he told me you ain't supposed to go to bed to midnight. That's what Brother Lockard said. And y'all folk love Brother Lockard. Y'all listen to him. You ain't supposed to go to bed to midnight. You know why? Because it might be the midnight cry. You don't want to be in the bed and Jesus come to you. That's what he said. And I knowed I could call him anytime before midnight and he'd be up. He didn't go to bed after midnight. That midnight cry is going to come one of these times. But you know it's good to have church family. Somebody's propping you up. Somebody's encouraging you. I mean, this this guy here has nobody and had nobody in life to call on when he needed some help or rescue. You know, a lot of folks think they're self-sufficient and they can stand on their own two feet and they can handle anything that comes their way. You know, it's amazing how God can send some stuff to knock you out from under your feet. They used to you used to use the, use the term how God knock the props out from under. And they'd get down out here and get down on the altar pray and say, God, knock the props out from under so and so, so they'll lean on you. Sometimes you need the props knocked out from under you so you'll realize Jesus is there. You can't stand, you can't go, you can't handle the troubles, you can't handle the trials. I mean, these folks went through stuff. I don't know how in the world you go through it without Jesus. I, I've not had to. I buried my mom and daddy and a whole bunch more I loved. And it's been Jesus that's helped me get through them. I preached my own mama's funeral. I preached Preacher Joe's funeral. I don't know how in the world I got through that. I ain't got a clue how I got through that. Yeah, I do. The grace of God. See, God's helped us through these things. This, this rich man didn't have, had all the money in the world. Rich, rich man. God labels him a rich man. There was a certain rich man. That's what God said about him. Now, if I say somebody's rich, that means they got a hundred dollars in their pocket. But somebody's got real money. When they say somebody else is rich, that means they some big money. And God said he was a rich man. Fared sumptuous every day. Sumptuous, had all kinds of overflowing supply. Got the nicest clothes in town. But he didn't have a church, family. He didn't have a family in church. But worse than that, he had a Christless life. I, I, I know this is hard for you, but don't you think just a minute, what if you didn't have Jesus? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that most of the folks in the building tonight, if not everybody in the building, saved by the good grace of God. You know what it is to have Jesus. And it's hard to think about, what if I didn't have Jesus? If you know anybody that's lost, that's where they are. See, when you think about folks that's without Christ, I, 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 I preached a message years ago for an hour and a half out of Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 12. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise and having no hope and without God in the world. Think just a minute about the folks about us that don't have Jesus. They don't have no hope. What are you hoping for? Gods of this world's dead. You hear me? They're dead. All the little gods that folks are worshiping this, this day and time, they're dead gods. Mine's alive and well and sitting on the throne. Can you prove that, preacher? I sure can because he's working in my heart. He's answering prayers. Amen. He'd give me a Bible that tells me so. Jesus loves me this I know, for the Bible tells me so. 
Imagine these folks that are without Christ. Here's a guy that, that Mark chapter 16, verse 26, fits for, for what is a man, uh, what, is, what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for? So I'll guarantee you if you'd have backed up 30 seconds before that man died and he'd have knew what he found out when he died, he would have been willing to give up everything he had for Jesus. You got any proof for that, preacher? I do. I do. If you're in the text that we're in tonight, the Bible says this man in hell lift up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus. He just went to hell, and he's already praying to Abraham. And he's got a concern for his brother that needs to be in the churches. We need to be concerned more than the rich man in hell about our family that's lost and undone without God. If you don't know as much as you can know that your family's saved, you ought to get behind this thing tonight and find out if they're saved. Tell them, listen, I, I'm not trying to be critical. I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm not trying to say you is, you ain't. I just want to know from you, do you know that you know that you're saved. Because if something happens and you die, I want to know you're in heaven. More than that, I want you to be in heaven. I don't want you to die and go to hell. I, I Honest, I, tonight, enemies, I, I don't want them to go to hell. You know what I want? I want them to get saved and then they'll be my brother's. Amen. That, that thing up there in the White House, if he gets saved by the good grace of God, he'd be a new creature in Christ Jesus, and he'd be your brother. God will forgive him for all his wickedness, same as he did me, same as he did you and others. See, a Christless life is a life without God. It's a life without Jesus. It's a life without love. You, 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 you realize what the Lord said in 1 John chapter 4, verse number 8? The Bible says there that God is love. So if they don't got God, they don't know what love is. We, 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 we hear folks say, I love you. That's the flesh love most of the time. Unless they're saved by the grace of God, they don't know what real love is. God love is agape love. Flesh love is a felicio love. They're different. There's two different loves there. You've seen folks that, that say they love others, and you watch them treat them like they don't. God said he loved me, and he's done nothing but prove that he loves me. While I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me because he loved me. He knew who I'd be, what I'd be, how bad I'd be. He knew my need for Calvary. He knew my need for salvation, that I couldn't save myself. And I was unworthy. I was unfit. I could, I could do nothing good. And he loved me anyway, and he died for me on Calvary. See, when you get a hold of the love of God, God loved us when we were sinners. That's real love. Loving somebody that's been bad is, is real love. Loving them in spite of their bad is real love. That's God love. You can't do that without God love. God is love, 1 John 4, 8. I'm, I'm thankful that I've experienced that. See, when you visit this rich man's house, it, you, you walk in that big fancy gate, and you walk down through there, and you see all these servants, and you, you see him as he comes to the door, and he's got these fancy, real nice, top-of-the-line, best, best of clothes. And he didn't go to Goodwill to get his shoes. I'm sorry, sandals. Probably the best, probably the best camel hide uh, sandals you could get back in them days. You see all the things sitting around the house, man. They wasn't nothing that he wanted for. He thought. But when you look at what he didn't have, 
He didn't have a family in church. He didn't have a church family. But worst and most of all is he did not have Christ. And the rich man in, rich man in hell lift up his eyes being in torment. All the money this man had could not change where he is. That was written many, many, many years ago. And it's still just as true today as it was when he wrote it. That rich man's still in hell. And Lazarus is still in Abraham's bosom. Lazarus is doing well. He didn't have much when he lived here on earth. And, and let's, just, let's just say, for instance, maybe he lived to be 95 years old, rich, had all kind of money. And let's say, let's say the beggar was the same age. He lived 95 years of begging. Poor, didn't even have, didn't even have a sandwich. He begged for crumbs. Ninety-five years, he was a beggar. But now he's in heaven with everything, and it's been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and he's never wanted for another bite. He's never been thirsty again. He's never wanted for a place to lay down and pillar his head. But on the contrary, the rich man's never been satisfied one second since he left this life. Anybody with good sense would see it's a whole lot better to be a beggar here than to be the rich man. I'm thankful that Lord Jesus Christ come by my way as of Friday, 51 years ago. 51 years ago on a Friday night on the old Miller Farm Road or the Miller Farm Road, there at the creek, little old church up on the hill, a preacher out of Caldwell County come down and preach revival that week. And that Friday night, God dealt my heart. I don't know how many times he dealt with me before that. I couldn't tell you. I don't know. But I know on that Friday night, I got an altar. I called on God. I ain't sure what all to say. But I know I said enough to get saved. I don't know what all I said when I got this thing. But I know I said enough that it's been there for 36 years and ain't nothing I can do to get rid of it right now. This side of heaven. I might get rid of it, but I'll be on the other side of heaven. God been good to me. He supplied my every need. There's things I thought I needed, thought I wanted, and he showed me they're not that valuable. But I wouldn't take nothing from my church family. I love you, church. And I thank you for loving me. And we've been putting up with each other for a long time. But that makes us family. And I'm thankful for a church family. But I'm thankful to have family in church. I'm thankful that I was raised up. We played and had a good time at Grandma's. But Grandma also set us down and read us some Bible stories. I've got her, I've got her little Bible story book that she used to open up and read little Bible stories to us. You know, them things ain't that much. You can go out Gillian's and find one on the used shelf. Probably not have to give over $3 for one. Grandma didn't have a lot of money. I don't remember what size her TV was, but it was one of them little ones that sat on a little old stand. Little old thing. Little old TV. We watched the Waltons and stuff like that once in a while. But I had a grandma who knew Jesus. No shame in calling on the Lord. Because of a praying grandma, I had a, a family that knowed God. That's the most important thing in life. You know, there's some folks can brag about how rich their daddies is, how, how uh, well known and how famous and powerful their folks may be. 
But I had a little country daddy that found, fell in love with Jesus sometime in October 1964. Right over the hill here, Command Baptist Church. He got saved by the grace of God. When he checked out his life, all the suffering and all this life had to offer was gone that quick. But you know, he ain't suffered again since 1995. He ain't wanted for nothing since November the 4th, 1995. He's been with his Savior since then. And I can rest and appreciate the goodness and the grace of God. I've got to take some walks down old memory lane this week. The first doctor that dealt with my daddy and helped and took care of him when he come down with cancer was the same one that committed the surgery on Judy Friday. Got to walk down memory lane. On that same Friday, I remembered as a seven-and-a-half-year-old boy, Jesus put me in the family of God. I ain't been nowhere near what I should have been. But I ain't going to hell. I don't have all the money that others have. But I got a church family that a lot don't have. I wouldn't be scared to call any of you at any time with a real need. And you'd do your best to help. I don't have a bit of problem believing that. That's the church family we got. We got praying family. Praise for each other. We don't have no problem throwing a hand up and say, hey, preacher, I need you to pray for so-and-so. Miss, Miss, Miss Sue wasn't a bit embarrassed tonight raise her hand and say, I got two on you to pray for. Didn't bother her. Uh, Corey di lifted up his hand the other night, had, had somebody at school whose daddy's sick. He didn't have no problem saying, hey, can I pray for my, my friend's dad? That's praying family. That's church family. When you visit the rich folks' house, You'll find out they ain't got what we got. I'm much richer than they are. I just ain't I just ain't touched all my riches yet. What 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 they worked a lifetime to have. This football player, two hundred and sixty million dollars. That wouldn't even buy my driveway. Straight to gold? What are you thinking? Wouldn't even buy my driveway. Jesus built the mansion over there. And he was carpenter's son here, so you know he knows how to build it right. Garth Brooks ain't got nothing on me. His little old mansion thing he's got out yonder somewhere, uh, 14,000 square foot. Uh, what's that going to be to my, my heavenly home? I got Jesus. So I guess what I'm trying to say to us, we're richer than the rich man. You got a church family, you got a family in church, and you got Christ. You ain't doing near as bad as you thought you was. Huh? A lot of folks today get depressed, discouraged, despondent, got a very dim outlook on life. Hey, when you got Jesus, you've got what you need. Hey, Amen. I'm understanding a little more what, what he's talking about, about being satisfied. Ain't it good to have Jesus? Thank you, Lord, for saving our soul. Thank you, Father, for putting us into thy family. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being willing to shed the blood. Offer the sacrifice that was necessary for me to be in the family. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to be worried about hell. Sometimes we've been begging, but we won't beg no more on that side. Thank you for showing us truth of how poor the rich man really was. Father, should there be somebody listening or somebody here that doesn't know you as their personal Savior? I pray tonight will be the night they come to know you as their Savior. Somebody's listening in, looking in with us tonight. If they don't have you, they don't have anything. 
Help them to realize that. Help them to do a real good evaluation of their life. Realize that the most important, the most needed thing in their life is you. Help them, Father, to bow their knee and call on you now that you might save them by your marvelous grace. And we'll thank you for it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. You mind the Lord. You may want to come pray. You may have been praying while I was. You just mind God. bless you. I'll see you Wednesday about 7 o'clock. Amen. You're liberty. If you want to go, go. <laughs> That's pretty good, ain't it? Amen. Let's do the chorus again. Do the chorus. Hit that chorus again. Roof up above me to sleep there's food on my table and food's on my feet you gave us your love Lord and a fine family thank you Lord for your blessings on me amen God bless you